segment, we're going to talk to Stefano about ICOs because most of us who are into crypto, our first experience is buying ICO, right? And uh, many of you have gotten burned and with the ICO market in 2018 looking terrible, uh, we want to find out what this man here thinks. And this guy, you have the highest number of Adobe certification in the world. And you have traveled around the world giving talks at many different areas, TED Talks, different platform, sharing your ideas. And thank you for coming down here on the show in Rock the Block Live to talk to our audience about ICO. Thank you for inviting me. So, first of all, maybe share with us what are your thoughts on the current market climate today? Because everything's so gloom and doom. That's a very interesting question. In fact, uh, you see, when we look at the market, I think that the first uh, observation should be that ICO don't technically uh, belong to the sphere of uh, finance purely. And so trying to understand ICO, analyzing it from the financial perspective might not be that accurate. Mm. Uh, one of the aspects that is very important to me in the uh, ICO industry, and that's why I'm invited all around the world to deliver my speech called IC Hollywood, is the entertainment side of ICOs. And the famous uh, FOMO, fear of missing out, or FUD, uh, are the driving factors for ICO, has been the driving factor for the ICO. Um, the idea of making money quickly was on the back of the mind of many during the crowd sales part. I think we are shifting towards a uh, area that is no longer investor only and no longer crowd sales only, mm -hmm. but we will start seeing a third party involved in the ICO, which are the strategic partners. Meaning to say that if an ICO is specifically targeted to a certain industry mm -hmm. of the market, then there will be market players coming in acquiring tokens together with investors from different industries and the crowd sales that want to use the token specifically for the usage within that ecosystem. So that is coming from a very use case, real business uh, direction. It's not just here's a template, here's a white paper hoping to raise funds. And we also see that there is a swing from the pure crowd sale and now that's moving away. And a lot of projects these days are saying that they're going to go on private round first before opening up to public. Um, now we see there's a imbalance of power because 70% is locked up in private and 20% is to public. That goes against the grain of what ICO is supposed to be or crowdfunding, right? Uh, what's your thought? I believe, I believe that a perfect ICO would have a 5% of seed, a 45% from private investor from any industry mm -hmm. and another 25% from strategic investors and a 25% from the public. These numbers can change uh, slightly, but definitely will not, will, we will probably not see another ICO again in future where uh, 80 or 90% come uh, from the crowd only or 80 or 90% come from the private investors only. There will be a mix of these two. And uh, we, we looked at hard cap and soft cap. Actually, this was something you brought up in your talk, which I attended. And I, I, I had a good laugh about it because uh, when, this is soft cap, this is hard cap. I don't believe in soft cap and hard cap. I believe in cap cap. <laughs> Tell us your philosophy on cap cap. I've got a lot of uh, controversial ideas about ICO. <laughs> one of them is this one. First of all, I think the token price is defined by the seed, not by arbitrary deciding an amount. Mm. Secondly, I think that the both soft cap and hard cap are not required uh, because in the end, what the company is trying to do is uh, uh, fundraising. And so if you compare it to the VC uh, strategy, the VC will never come to you and say, here is 20 million, show me what you can do. A VC come to you and say, here is the first half a million, show me what you can do. I come back one year later and if you have done well, then we grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until an IPO. IPO is the destination in a traditional uh, fundraising mm -hmm. for startup. It ended up to be the objective of the business during the ICO and it doesn't make any sense. And so uh, there are many things that are controversial. The fact, for instance, that we have a fini finite number of tokens, mm. which in uh, my opinion doesn't necessarily define the stability of the price of the token. In fact, mm. many of the ICOs where the price is collapsing for the token, well, they have a finite number of tokens, but it didn't prevent the, the price of the token from falling. And it goes along with the idea of the hard cap and soft cap. If you ask anyone why you decided that soft cap, why you decided that hard cap, some of the explanations that I heard are pretty hilarious. <laughs> if you look at the pie chart on their white paper, say we're going to invest 20% in technical development. And then you find soft cap is 5 million, hard cap is 100 million. Well, is it 20% of 5 million or 20% of 100 million? Because with 20% of 100 million, you can develop Google from scratch. And I don't think that most of the startups want to do that. 
<laughs> and uh, there's one more other controversial idea that you're putting forth. It's not an ICO. It's a, what, a CCO? Yeah. And that was uh, your thing, right? You came up with that. I, I keep sticking on this one. For the past six months, uh, every time I go on stage or they interview me, I keep bringing up the idea that you don't need the I in an ICO. And my, my, I'm imagining that the I for ICO is because one guy one day went to an investor and I told him, hey, why don't we make uh, an IPO, but we pretend money. <laughs> and the uh, investor said, tell me more about this. It's like an IPO. But with coins, and so, so it's an ICO. ICO. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine the conversation went that way, because if you think of it, it doesn't make any sense to have a letter I at the beginning of an ICO. And so my, for, my prediction is that there will be no longer an I, and there could be an O or a C, as in ongoing coin offering or continuous coin offering, OCO or CCO. Or alternatively, just simply, coin offering and you can make as many coin offering as you want as you want you don't have to do one and forever you'll never do it again you just make as many coin offering as you need in order to fuel the funding of your startup if at this point you need for your startup just a poc a proof of concept and then the poc is five hundred thousand dollars you don't need a hard cap of 100 million you just need a coin offering that says slightly less than that like four hundred thousand is the soft cap Slightly more than that, hard cap is 600000 And so now you have a window of only $200,000 to participate in this coin offering. And it's great because when you approach the investors, you sell them the idea of investing based on scarcity, not on abundance. They know that they can participate in the coin offering only within a frame of $200,000. Less than $400,000, they can't participate because the project is cancelled. More than $600,000, they can't participate because the tokens are returned. So it's a small window, it builds up demand, and that's why I think that the market sucks right now because there, is too much to, too many, there are too many tokens, mm. tokens in the market and the investors are pretty much the same. So it's, it's not so much that uh, you need to limit the coin, uh, the number of coins you have to create a false demand. It can be unlimited, but when the, each coin is being released at each stage, that's when the limited time, that's where the scarcity happens. I, I believe so, because look, when they founded the United States of America, or as far as I know, any other country in the world, they didn't say this is the limited amount of fiat currency that we're going to issue, and if you don't get it, it's bad for you. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's, a normal, uh, it's a normal process in any country that whenever the GDP grows, the government uh, fuels the economy with more, more currency and, and stimulates the economy with more issuance of currency. President Bush made more debt in the United States that the entire lot of presidents <laughs> before him and Obama managed to do the same, including Bush. And out of 31.5 trillion dollars uh, in existence of the United States of America, only 1.5 have been printed, which means that already 90 over percent of the currency for the United States is digital and is issued digitally. And so we should follow what countries do successfully because United States dollar is still pretty much a standard no, in yeah. measuring things. And you guys think that cryptocurrency is made from air. Now, just take a look at a staggering percentage. Now, speaking of controversial topic, you're an advisor for lots of projects, right? Under, uh, if you want to find out more, go to vox.sg, uh, where you can uh, look at the various services that you provide. And one of the main things that you do is to advise uh, businesses that want to go on a blockchain. There's a lot of advisors out there, including a grandmother, everyone's out there saying that they are advisors too. Uh, what is your personal philosophy and your pillar that you hold on to that defines your brand? I would say, first of all, never expect, expect perfection from blockchain. Mm. Uh, in fact, you say I'm advising on many projects. I try to keep these numbers small. If I were to go with all the projects that I've been contacted every day on LinkedIn, then I will not be able to stick to my philosophy. And my philosophy is this one. If you are able to answer the question, why do you need blockchain? Why do you need a token? Why do you need an ICO? With something that is compelling, something that makes sense, then we go back, we go to the next uh, question, uh, the next philosophy, which is don't be afraid. Don't start thinking whether it's a security or a utility. There is always a solution for that, provided that philosophy number three, you're doing good. So if your purpose is not to take uh, blockchain too seriously, uh, not being afraid of being framed for whatever you're trying to do to change the world and you are always planning to do good, not to harm anyone, not to scam anyone, this project will succeed. And uh, not only that, there are also five pillars that I think they are very important in defining the success of an ICO. The number one pillar where everyone unfortunately stops is the amount of money that has been raised. 
they see a large number, they go crazy. A billion dollars was uh, raised. Okay, cool. What's next? The second one is, was the price of the token stable? Mm -hmm. the, the, if the price of the token collapsed five times, ten times, I wouldn't consider the ICO a success. Uh, the third one is, did the investor get the money back? Very important as well. Uh, small investors, large investors. Fourth, where it start getting very interesting for me, is did they develop anything at all that is actually working? And the fifth one is, did they manage the, to make the startup a business success? Are they actually generating revenues? And before evaluating an ICO, I really want to look at all the five steps. That's very, very informative, actually. With that five steps alone, that's pretty much a good tip for a lot of ICO founders out there to even just hear this and keep them in line. But uh, I have a lot more questions to ask, but now let's bring it back to you guys. Uh, we are on Facebook.com slash RockTheBlockLive or YouTube, uh, rock, rock, YouTube.RockTheBlock.Live. Uh, let's go down to the questions. Uh, we have one from our Rock the Block Live admin who's asking, people are skeptical about crypto projects. How can you spot us? I think it's pretty good because everyone's trying to make money and there's a lot of promises about Moon and, and Lambos. How do you spot a scam? That's a very interesting question. First of all, what is a scam? In uh, the presentation I see Hollywood, I always bring up the fact that if you look at Transformer as a movie, the script of the movie is not impressive. It's actually a very boring movie if you read what they wrote. And if you compare this one to a white paper, there are some of the white papers that are very boring. The white paper of Bitcoin is nine pages. <laughs> if you have ever read it, it's one of the most boring things that you can read. But then you give a boring script to a fantastic movie producer like Lorenzo di Bonaventura, and he makes out of Transformer a $1.1 billion movie. So is that a scam? Well, if you look at the content, it is a scam. If you look at the performance, some might say it is not a scam. It's the same logic for an ICO. What is a scam ICO? To me, a scam ICO is the one that stops at number four. They attract a lot of money. They manage to keep the token price high with good market makers. They give the money back to the investor, but sorry, we couldn't develop anything. Mm. Or we didn't do anything to make the business profitable. Take, for example, uh, Uber. Uh, is Uber successful? Uh, it's hard to say because they, they just sold out to, to grab. So some people will say it's a failure, right? Yeah, it depends on when you measure it. Two years ago, the first time I saw grab was like, huh? someone is trying to compete with Uber? Yeah. How is that even possible? And now they kick them out of the market. So it really, it really depends where you look at it, when and when you look at the success story. Mm -hmm. So I would say it's difficult nowadays that someone really does an ICO for the pure purpose of scamming people. And if they do it with an ICO, guess what? They might do it as well with any other business. Mm. Don't you, in, at the end of the day, receive every week an email that tells you that you have inherited $32 million <laughs> from Nigeria <laughs> and you have to open a bank account in Lloyd in the United Kingdom? Isn't that a scam? And it's not an ICO. So stop saying that ICO are all scam and stop saying that all the scams are in ICO. There are scams everywhere, but of course, someone pulled a scam in ICO and it tainted the name of the industry. I thought I was the only one who got a Nigerian email. <laughs> <laughs> and now we have one more from, um, where's this? Uh, oh, oh, Terence Ang. Terence Ang, thank you for, for catching us here. Is it true, after the record-breaking all-time high in December 2017, that Bitcoin is now held majority-wise in the hands of short-term speculators rather than long-term hodlers, which may explain the current market dip and the volatility of the coin? Wow. Interesting. First of all, what is volatility? To me, it was pretty volatile even when you jump from 1,000 to 10,000 at that point in time. Uh, I would say that now is more stability than volatility in a sense. But of course, when you introduce tools like futures in any transaction, you allow, you allow those that don't, don't own an asset to trade the asset without owning it. It makes it very easy to manipulate the market. There was a period in time, as you were saying during uh, one of the conferences recently, that if you, buy the to if you buy the coin on a certain day of the week and yeah. you sell it on another day of the week, mathematically you are making money out of it. So rather than keep looking at the price of Bitcoin, I think we have, we have many, all, not all, but many have lost focus on what is the purpose of having Bitcoin. And uh, we are looking only at the moon and the Lambo, <laughs> but we are not really looking at the technology and uh, what, what the original idea was for, uh, for the uh, cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. And especially the myth that is safe, especially the myth that is cheap, especially the myth that is transparent, oh, yeah. these are all myth. It doesn't really apply, right? 
Do I have to explain why? Or no, no. <laughs> I'm sure that our, our viewers for Rock the Block, they are quite well informed on such things. So we have one more the time, last question that we have. Uh, here's by Malcolm Chang. Oh, he was actually the speaker for last week. Uh, he says, with the current regulations, many lawyers right now caution against doing public sale because he's the marketing director for Swipe, so he's doing public sale right now. Uh, what is your opinion on the importance of public sales? Should we go public sale or no public sale? Yeah, it's a, good, a very good question, Malcolm. Um, in fact, uh, look, if you don't go public sales, then it's no longer a coin offering. It's just a investment. Then go to a VC. Um, if it has to go for uh, coin offering or initial coin offering, continuous coin offering, ongoing coin offering, it has to have some elements of community, some elements of crowd sale. And I would say that my prediction is that in the next uh, few months, six to nine months, there will be one more country coming up uh, wanting to stand out like Estonia did uh, last year or Malta did last year. And uh, Singapore still is holding a prominent position. And they will just say, hey, you can do whatever you want with us. And they will probably come up from out of nowhere. I mean, not out of nowhere, but one of those countries that the last time you mentioned it, you were 10 years old and you were in school. And they will say, hey, you know what? We, we, nobody wants your business. We want your business. <laughs> and no one knows where Malta was <laughs> until recently, right? Well, thank you, Stefano, for being on the show. That was very insightful. I'm going to go for my third segment this evening, but don't go anywhere. We're going to have whiskey right after this. <laughs> thank you.